EP1100, Data Communication and Computer Networks. Some illustrations in this material are collected from the book by Forsan, Data Communications and Networking, published by McGraw-Hill. In the previous parts, I've shown examples of transmission medium, and we also looked at the ultimate limits of data communication that you can get from a given medium, the Shannon capacity. Now I will show you some actual methods of transmitting data over transmission medium. We have two examples called coding and modulation. If you have a low pass channel which permits frequencies from zero up to some maximum limit, you can use something called line coding to carry the data. Or it's also referred to as baseband modulation. It's basically a direct current or a continuous light signal that is being modulated to carry the data. If you instead have a bandpass channel, then you need a carrier signal that lies somewhere in the passband and you modulate that in order to carry the data. These are the two principles that I will show you. The line coding or baseband modulation is used to turn data into transmission signal. It uses discrete amplitude levels and the transitions between the levels occur at discrete times. So it's a clocking where each clock interval corresponds to one or a fixed number of bits. The signal is constant between these transmission times as shown in the figure up to the right. You can see that a zero level corresponds to a zero in the data and a high level corresponds to a one in the data. And you see that the signal remains low or zero and or high but has no intermediate values and there's a sharp transition between the low and the high levels. The effect is that if you create such a signal and look at the Fourier spectrum of the signal, it has an infinite bandwidth. While it's being transmitted through the low pass channel, some of the higher frequencies will be attenuated and you will only receive the, the lower frequencies of, of the signal spectrum. This means that the signal that's being received is not as sharp in the transitions as was sent. Here's an actual case of a line coding. It's called unipolar encoding, and it's an example that was used in the previous picture. This signal contains a direct current component, a zero frequency component. You can imagine if you only transmit an infinite string of ones, then you will have a fixed voltage and your air current will flow through the cable. The average level of the signal will thus depend on the number of ones that you have in the signal, but it will always be above zero. This type of coding is only possible if you have a cable that permits a direct current to flow through the cable. It's important that the receiver is able to clock the signal, so it, so it should know how long the bit intervals are, as seen from the transmitter. In this encoding, if you s transmit a long stretch of only zeros or only ones, you can imagine that the receiver will not have any transitions to indicate the edges of a, an interval. Therefore, the receiver might lose synchronization with the sender. So we would like to have a signal with a lot of transitions because the transitions mark the beginning and the end of the bit intervals. So the receiver has some information to, to synchronize its clock to. Here is another example of a line coding. This is called non-return to zero, NRZ. The picture shows two ways of uh, encoding the data. In the upper figure, the data is encoded by the level of the signal. So a positive level is represents a zero and a negative level represents a 1. If zeros and 1s are equally likely in the data, then you will not have a DC component in this signal. In the lower figure, we show the same non-return to zero code, but it encodes the data in a different way. It has a transition if the next bit is a 1. The advantage by coding through the transitions is that the signal becomes less sensitive to attenuation because it's not the level that's been detected, it's the transition between the levels that is detected. So you see here, zero remains a high level, and then the next bit is one, so there's a transition, 
and then after the one there's two zeros so there's no transitions then there comes a one so there is a transition actually there are three ones in a row so there are three transitions each encoding one bit synchronization is still a problem with nrz because we can still have very long stretches of zeros and ones so that there are no transitions at all and therefore the receiver will not have information to synchronize its clock to. So here is another line code called return to zero, which always have a transition in order to make sure that there's clocking information to the receiver. We use two signal elements per bit interval. So one bit is encoded as two elements. The, the first element is either positive or negative, and the second element is always zero, which means that in every interval, there's always a transition going from positive to zero or going from negative to zero. So in terms of DC component, it's similar to NRZ, but it has a better clocking frequency. However, the board rate is now twice the bit rate because we have two signal elements for each bit transmitted. If we're willing to have a higher board rate, we can also have a Manchester code. The advantage compared to, uh, to the return to zero is that here we only use two different levels. We don't have a zero level, we have a positive and a negative level. And there's a, a transition so that a zero is represented from, from positive to negative and a one is represented from negative to, to positive. The advantage with the Manchester code is that it, there is a transition in every bit interval so that the receiver can synchronize its clock to the sender clock. Another possibility to make sure that you have good clocking information is to use a block code. This code is applied to the data. It transforms the data before the line coding. Here we show, show something called 4B, 5B. So 4 bits in, 5 bits out. So you take the data, you group it into 4-bit patterns. There are 16 combinations of those. And you map those into 5-bit patterns. So we have 32 different outgoing patterns and we choose the outgoing patterns so that we have a certain number of ones and zeros. So even if we encode the data by a non-return to zero code, we are sure that there will be transitions and we have clocking information uh, to the receiver. There are also other variants such as 8-bit, 10-bit codes. Here you increase the data rate by going to 4 to 5 bits or from 8 to 10 bits. But on the other hand, you can use a simple line code such as non-return to zero, which has a board rate which is equivalent to the data rate, rather than using return to zero or Manchester, which has a board rate which is twice the data rate. Modulation. Modulation is the technique we use when we have a bypass channel. We take a sinusoidal wave we position it well in the passband and then we modulate one or several of the parameters of the sine wave. So you see here the function s of t is a sinusoidal. It has an amplitude a, it has a frequency f, and it has a phase phi. So these are the three parameters that we can change to represent data. A bit interval will be some duration of the sinusoidal where it remains constant before we change it to represent another data bit. Here we show amplitude shift keying, ASK. It uses two amplitudes, a lower and a higher one. You see in the first interval that a zero is represented by a low amplitude, and then in the second interval a one is represented by a higher amplitude. This type of encoding is sensitive to um, attenuation because the amplitudes uh, will tend to zero and of course it's also uh, subjected to noise that will be added to the signal so that it can be difficult to detect whether the received signal is low or high in amplitude. Then we can use the frequency. Here we show uh, the zero bit being encoded by a lower frequency and the bit value 1 is represented by a higher frequency. The signal strength is the same throughout the signal. So that means that all intervals are affected equally by attenuation and the attenuation of course does not affect the frequency. So the limitation here is the bandwidth of the passband of the medium. A third possibility is to use the phase. So you see the zero bit is represented by one phase, and the one bit is represented here 
by a phase which is 180 degrees shifted from the zero bit. The signal level remains constant for the signal and the detector has to detect the phase changes from one bit to, to the next. You can combine these different formats and here is an example called quadrature amplitude modulation which uses two amplitude values and four phase values. So that gives you uh, two bits for the phase values and one bit for the amplitude values. So in total each signal element can encode three bits. So I've now shown how you can represent data as signals that travel through a medium. Now we go over some data transmission modes. You can transmit data in parallel or serially. If you transmit it serially you can have an asynchronous and synchronous mode. The, the parallel transmission is most common inside computers. A computer bus or any data path on a printed circuit board are usually carrying the data in parallel. So here we show that 8 bits are transferred in parallel at any one time. There could be additional conductors that carry, for instance, clocking information as well. This is also what you have in parallel cables, for instance, to connect a printer. Serial transmission takes the data, which might be structured in data words or bytes, and then it sends them serially, one bit at a time. It's important that the sender and the receiver agree on the order of the deserialization. For instance, if you have a byte, should the most significant bit be sent first or should the least significant bit be sent first? Either order will work, but the sender and receiver have to agree on the order. Here you need some other clocking information, external clocks of course, but uh, the type of line coding uh, that, that I showed could be used here so that uh, the signal itself carries enough timing information for the receiver to synchronize its clock to. The next aspect of data communication is framing of messages. A sender will not be active continuously for all times. It will have data to send, and then, when the data has been sent, it may remain idle for a long period of time. This has to be communicated to the receiver so that the receiver knows that this end of message and then whatever signal it receives will be noise generated in the medium. And then, later on, when a new message comes, the receiver has to be able to detect that there is a new message starting and it should now detect the, the signal and, and translate the signal into data. We call this framing. So it marks start and stop of messages. It's some control data that's added for each message. So the data that's generated from a higher layer, ultimately from an application, will now be framed by, by some predefined bit sequence at the beginning and end of the message. The framing also allows multiplexing of messages from multiple sources. If each source is only active a small percentage of time, then several sources could share a channel, for instance a radio channel. There will therefore be frames coming separately from each source towards the receiver. It could also be that a frame is shared by multiple sources that are co-located so they, they can put the data in different parts of one and the same frame. Multiplexing. Multiplexing is the concept of sharing a link. Here we show a simple example where there are four possible inputs on the left side to the multiplexer. There's one link carrying a bit stream or frames of bits, but it's divided into four channels. And then the multiplexer will separate out these channels and deliver them. So we have emulated here a situation where we have four different links outside the MUX, but they're implemented as one link um, in one transmission medium. This allows multiple sender-receiver pairs to share a link and to share the resources of that link because it could be that the resource of the medium is so high that not any single sender would generate as much data as the medium can, gen uh, can carry. For instance, a um, fiber optical cable. There are several ways of sharing the resource of the transmission medium. One is that we look at the bandwidth of the transmission medium and we divide that into different frequency channels and let each sender-receiver pair have its own reserved uh, frequency range. Another thing is that we modulate or, or line code uh, for the entire bandwidth of the medium and then we divide up that bit stream into uh, time units and each time unit correspond to the slot that a sender will have available to send its data.
In the first case, we talk about analog multiplexing. And this method of dividing up the bandwidth into frequency regions called frequency division multiplexing. It uses a modulation for each frequency channel. We have a carrier frequency that is positioned in the channel that has been allocated. This is the method that's being used for broadcast radio and television, where, for instance, different radio channels uh, correspond to a frequency range that they have. The center frequency, which is used by the carrier frequency, and a bandwidth around it that they have to remain within. The concept is also used in optical networks, where it's referred to as wavelength division multiplexing. It's the same concept as FDM, and here it corresponds to sending the data with different wavelength channels or different colors of the light that's being transmitted. And then we have digital multiplexing, where we let the sender generate a data rate for the entire bandwidth of the medium. Then we divide the times into slots and uh, allocate slots to the different senders. So the demultiplexer will then know that in each frame, the first slot belongs to channel 1, the second slot belongs to channel 2, and it will separate out the slots and deliver the data to the receivers of those channels. This is called asynchronous time division multiplexing. We can also have an asynchronous time division multiplexing, where each source gets its own frame that's sent into the medium. The frame will then have an address to indicate which channel that it belongs to so that the demultiplexer can take the frame and deliver it to the right receiver. Here is an example of synchronous time division multiplexing for telephony. So as we heard in the PCM part, the 4 kilohertz of voice spectrum is PCM coded, resulting in 64 kilobits per second of data. Such streams were multiplexed one byte per input and put into frames. In the uh, United States, there were 24 channels. In Europe and many other parts of the world, there were 30 channels, resulting in a total bit rate of 2 megabits per second. And then there's a whole hierarchy of these E1 or T1 channels being multiplexed together to higher data rates, up to hundreds of megabits per second. Here's another example, the digital subscriber loop. This is a high-speed digital access that uses the old telephone wires that go into most homes. It uses the actual bandwidth in the twisted pair cable um, in the subscriber access lines. Even though an analog voice call was only 4 kilohertz in bandwidth, the cables permit up to over megahertz in, in bandwidth. The bandwidth of the medium is subject to strict physical limitations. It has a high attenuation, so you can only go short distances, and it requires advanced signaling. This is one way that the uh, subscriber loop is being used. It takes the full spectrum of the medium and divides it into frequency bands. There is one band reserved for traditional analog voice communication, and then here you see there are bands that are not being used, and then other bands that are used for upstream, because this particular mode is called asymmetrical DSL, then there are other channels, more channels used for downstream data. So that's why it's asymmetrical. You get more data in the downstream direction. The bandwidth of the channels is 4 kilohertz. And there is an adaptation so that the, the data rate per channel is adapted to the conditions of that channel. It could even be that an individual channel is not used at all if it's very poor quality. This is used for residential ac broadband access for data. In the upstream direction, typically up to 1 megabit per second, and in the downstream direction, 8 megabits per second, uh, but nowadays uh, higher 24 megabits and up to 100 megabits per second, depending on the quality of the cable. This shows how it's accomplished. There's a voice channel, which is just transparent, and then th there's a serial to parallel converter here, so the data is sent in parallel over the different channels. And then there's an advanced modulation, quadrature amplitude modulation, which has 15 bits per board for each channel. And you see the same modulation being used for the downstream channels. So each channel being 4 kilohertz, and there's 15 bits per board, it means that you can carry 60 kilobits per second per channel. So in summary for this teaching module, I've showed transmission media, how you can see, look at the link budget and the capacity limitations of it. 
We have in this part looked at uh, the transmission of digital information by line coding and digital modulation. I have briefly mentioned synchronization and multiplexing and shown examples of multiplexing such as PCM of uh, digital telephony or synchronous digital subscriber loop.